It is 5.30, and I would like to welcome you all to the Monday, June Recording 28th, in progress. Maplewood City Council Manager Workshop. Uh, Mr. Sable, I understand you are going to be stepping in as the city clerk tonight. Would you please take the roll call? Uh, yeah, good. thank you, Mayor. Um, Council Member Juniman. Here. Council Member Villa Vicencio. No. Do not see Councilmember Villa Vicencio yet. Uh, Councilmember Knutson. Here. Councilmember Cave. Here. Mayor Abrams. I am here as well. Thank you for the roll call. Uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Moved by Knutson, seconded by. Rebecca, second. Thank you, Councilmember Cave. Uh, moved and seconded by, or moved by Knudsen, seconded by Cave, the motion to approve the agenda. Is there any further discussion? Then our order tonight will be Councilmember Cave, Councilmember Juniman, Councilmember Knudsen, and Councilmember Villa Vicencio. So, Councilmember Cave, how do you vote? Aye. Councilmember Juniman? Aye. Councilmember Knudsen. Aye. And Councilmember Villa Vicencio. Hi. Um, I apologize for being a couple minutes late. So I I don't know exactly the motion that you were um, trying to approve. We are approving the agenda. Oh, okay. Well then I. Okay, and I vote I as well. The motion uh, passes. We have no unfinished business tonight. We have two items under new business. The uh, first item is the capital improvement plan for 2022 to 2026. Uh, Ms. Palseth, this is your agenda item. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Mary Brothers and Council. I do have a short PowerPoint, so I am going to attempt to share my screen. Um, and do you see that? Yes, we do. Okay. And I would like um, Mr. Fultz, um, could you please verify that the participants are seeing the full participant screen and not the uh, presenter screen? Yeah, it looks perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> now that we have this all figured out, we'll be back in person <laughs> next meeting. But um, so I, you, you will recognize some of these slides from before, but we do have new council members as well. So I wanna walk through some of the basics. Um, Mr. Love will be um, on tonight too, to talk about the road projects. So we have two different things going on um, with this tonight. We're gonna walk through some slides and give you a preview of um, what the proposed capital improvement plan looks like for the next five years or what um, we're proposing. It would look like and then secondly i would be going on to the city's website and giving you a demonstration of our new online cip portal so let's start out with um, the slideshow so tonight we're just basically going to talk a little bit about the projects primarily the road projects and talk about uh, specifically what's going to happen in 2022 because those are the projects that you will be allocating funding for with the 2022 budget in, in December. Um, this is an ever evolving process. Um, the capital improvement plan, where we're at in the process now is um, the needs um, are have been identified. That again is, is an evolving process. Um, it all uh, falls through the, um, the pillars of our long range strategic plan. Everything has to align with that. Uh, we then continually look for funding sources to fund the projects um, that, that uh, then get entered into the proposed plan once we find funding sources. So that's what we're, where we're at right now tonight is on that step. And then the council will um, consider these projects and adopt the CIP um, along with the annual capital budget. And then the, the staff will begin to implement it in the next year, keeping in mind that um, each project in the CIP will be 
um, approved by the council before the project takes place, regardless of what the CI what projects are in the CIP. This is a planning document. It does not approve any projects to go forward. Talk a little bit about the financing um, in, in major categories. So for vehicles and equipment, we have good systems set up basically have two major categories. We have public works fleet equipment and we have um, public safety fleet equipment. Um, and we have a fund for each of those. And there is an, a, a certain amount that gets levied each year to go into that fund. Each each piece of equipment in, in each of those separate fleets has a life cycle. And so we know kind of approximately when um, when it needs to be replaced and how much it's going to cost um, approximately to replace it. So we plan this out for 10 and even 20 years. Um, he, as always, um, things get reprioritized. As you know, certain pieces of equipment may break down before others. And so there's, there's always a little bit of shuffling that goes on. But primarily our equipment is on a pay-as-you-go basis. Each piece of equipment that um, it is in the plan, doesn't necessarily um, get replaced on the year that it's planned. It depends on the condition of the equipment. The public works director and his staff may, de may decide that um, they can get another year or two. It's, it's all evaluated on an annual basis, but we do fund it um, on, on an annual basis so that money is there to replace the equipment when it goes down. Um, it, the only uh, piece of equipment that we really don't have a, a plan for and as far as pay as you go would be the, uh, the ladder truck. And we did talk about that um, earlier. That's coming up in 2022. We will either do that on a tax exempt lease or use the coronavirus funds for that. Um, second is building for improvements. We do have a building fund and um, we need, you know, we need to increase that. Um, a little bit to keep up with the repairs that are needed. We do not really have a plan in place to replace buildings such as the North Fire Station, and, and that is very appropriately financed um, with debt. Streets and infrastructure, a variety of funding sources there. We still do use debt. About a third of our, our uh, costs are um, uh, still funded through debt. Um, we have long range plans to try to get to a pay as you go basis as many cities do um, that have as, as many miles of streets. Um, there isn't a year that we can actually carve out and say we're not going to do streets this year um, because we don't have the money. It's just simply there are too many streets um, on an annual basis that are in need of repair. Um, so it's it's a very um, known cost on an annual basis um, of approximately how much is needed to uh, repair the amount of streets that need to be repaired. So um, looking forward, um, we, you know, we do have some proposals to get to a pay as you go basis, but we're just not there yet. Park improvements are primarily through park dedication fees and, and potentially debt if the council should decide. Redevelopment can be done with tax increment financing. We do have in our financing plan some placeholder debt, um, but it may or may not be issued. It's just in the plan just in case we need it. Again, um, we just follow some of the same uh, principles that we've been following the last few years. We got a good idea about council priorities at various planning sessions. We know that debt reduction is important. We know that the street improvements are important and we have been leveraging local government aid to pay for street improvements and we have not been using it um, for uh, one time for anything other than these one time expenditures. We haven't been using it for operating or really anything else. Um, it's been going um, primarily to street improvements the last few years, always moving towards a, a pay as you go wherever we can um, and keeping a sustainable plan in place while still trying to make room for some economic development. Again, the major um, challenge that we always have is to continue to do debt reduction and still um, and still do the street improvements that are needed. And I think we have a good plan in place this year um, as we have um, over the last few years um, to continue moving on this, on this uh, vein. Um, so where we are at tonight is the first workshop. 
the Planning Commission will view these projects at a public hearing in July. Um, there may or may not be another council workshop, but the city council will have the opportunity to have a hearing in December um, before adoption of the plan with the final budget. Again, this is a planning document. It doesn't authorize the expenditures. Um, ad adoption is required. Um, it's part of the process for us to issue certain types of debt. So it's uh, the having a CIP in place is, is part of the debt financing plan. Um, for some of the street projects, um, but it does not authorize any of them. The city council will authorize um, each of these major expenditures one by one. Overall, um, in this five-year plan, $66 million, as you can see, 75% of it is streets, so um, pretty much eclipses all the other categories. We do have 8.2% of, of the budgeted plan, 5.4 million is for park improvements, and that's part of the city's um, commitment to putting, um, taking care of what you have and putting a million dollars per year into park improvements. So still working um, towards that goal as well. So for funding sources for the five-year plan, um, as you can see about uh, on um, for, for the total plan, about 30 to 33% um, is still debt that's um, considerably lower than um, the 50 to 60% that we started out with um, about five or six years ago. So um, we have um, carved a, a lot of uh, a lot of the debt out of this um, out of this chart. We look at this on an annual basis. Um, governmental funds also include the franchise fees that we're bringing into those funds. So just to explain that, that's where a good portion of the funding is coming from rather than debt. And also the enterprise funds, meaning the utility funds um, that finance the utility component of the street reconstruction projects. So the water and the sewer and the storm. And intergovernmental revenue also um, enters in. Um, sometimes there is um, MSA construction aid and other sources of intergovernmental revenue, including local government aid that we use on our street projects. So to look at the five-year plan for the debt that's related to um, the projects that are included in this plan, and um, we have a, a pretty good idea of what it's going to look like. Um, so starting out um, at the end of 2020 with uh, 66 million, um, we're still kind of on track um, to be under 50 million. Um, we'd planned on that uh, last year by the uh, end of 2025. It, it may still happen simply because the tax increment debt that's planned may not be issued. Um, maybe some of the park debt um, that is planned may not be issued. So we could very well get, get there um, in 2024 or 2025. But right now, by 2026, we're looking at being under 50 million in outstanding debt. Um, and part of part of how we're doing that as well is we're not issuing debt for special assessments. A couple years ago, we started financing those through our street fund. We used a little bit of local government aid to get that started. And now it's a revolving fund. And what really helped it get going is um, when special assessments are adopted on an annual basis for the street projects for the coming year, often what happens is... Um, taxpayers or, or um, community members um, who benefit from the project will pay for that special ass assessment upfront rather than have it put on their taxes and pay over a 15 year period. So um, in, for instance, in 2020, um, we collected over a million dollars in prepaid assessments. And, and so that again means for those residents who chose to pay upfront. And so that really helps to, to get that fund moving. And so then that's now our revolving fund um, that we use to finance our own special assessments. And as those special assessments over 15 years come in, the city also gets the interest on it. So um, over the over that 15 years. So it, it's, it's significant. The city could earn um, nearly 4 million in the first 15 years just on those projects. And then that will be 
a revolving fund to go um, towards more street projects. So I really feel like this is very key to our, um, one of the key things to our success in moving towards um, more of a pay-as-you-go model. We've had, um, it's, it's worked out very well for us so far. Um, so for 2022, roughly about a third of um, the projects will be um, financed with geo bonds. And you can see about 12% with finance fee or franchise fees and utility funds about 27%. Special assessments 17, keeping in mind that those uh, special assessments are financed internally. We're not issuing debt to finance those. So um, everything that's in the um, hash mark is all internal financing. There's no debt. So about a third of it is debt. So again, considerably down from the 50 to 60% that it was. Um, and just to give you a, 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 the slide we just had a few slides ago, just to give you a longer term look at that. Um, as, as we kind of see these projections in our 10 year plan, we're really looking at being under 40 million in 10 years. So um, really getting to um, where, where we wanna be with that. Um, so the progress just continues to roll. Um, and, and that's the reason why we do the 10 year plan is uh, even even though some of the projects are are somewhat placeholders um, because 10 years out um, it, a, a certain project might get reprioritized you know many times but um, we put it in there just to, so that we have a an idea of how much debt we're going to be issuing, whether or not it's affordable, how much operational costs are going to be associated with these projects, and plug that into our, our uh, property tax calculation just to determine whether or not these things are affordable as we move through, um, so that we have at least some idea and um, and keep us on that track of, of being a keeping these things affordable so that there are no surprises. So if Mr. Love is on the line, um, are you yes. there? Yes. Great. Yep, I'm here. Um, Mayor and Council, so looking at the 2022-2026 CIP plan, um, I, as Finance Director Paul Sess was saying, you know, one of the advantages of, of doing a five-year plan and redoing it every year is we get to evaluate and make changes. So if a, a street area gets worse uh, over one winter, you know, we can um, adjust the priority of that. Uh, for, for this plan, we're proposing 21 miles of uh, proposed street reconstruction projects. This would both be full reconstruction as well as reclaim uh, projects. Uh, that's about 15.6% of the city streets in total. Uh, one of the other things that's included in this plan is spot paving and there's a picture there on your right that uh, kind of shows what our crews are doing in areas that we know are um, in that five to ten year uh, range before we get in there with the cip project but our crews are having a hard time holding the road together we're using this spot paving so it's a thin coat of uh, asphalt over the troubled area it's essentially a uh, band-aid uh, but it certainly provides a lot of relief uh, for the residents and it frees our crews up from having to return to the same area and filling the same potholes multiple times during the season. Uh, this has been funded through the SRF fund um, and it's been uh, very, very well received both by um, our residents as well as the crews themselves. They feel like they're making a good difference with these with the spot paper. Next slide. Uh, so for in 2022, what we're proposing, uh, Cope Avenue would be um, a reclaim project. Uh, there may be, we might be looking at things like, um, it's a four lane road. We might be looking at either narrowing or restriping to a three lane road. There's about one mile there between English and uh, White Bear. Um, would also be looking at pedestrian improvements there. The pavement condition out there is uh, has is a rating of 41. That's out of a scale of one to 100. Uh, next project would be Jarvis Avenue. This is a full reclaim project. It's about 2.67 miles and has a pavement condition rating of 45. So again, reclaim projects are not quite as intensive. Uh, they it, we're grinding up the asphalt, uh, 
reforming the base and putting a new layer of asphalt in. And the last project would be the McMenemy Street project. This would be from Larpenter to County Road B. It's a one mile stretch. This is a full reconstruction project. And this is the one that earlier here uh, this year, we found out we did get a grant from MnDOT on, uh, it was 1.125 million, uh, which will certainly help us uh, with this project. Overall in 2022, we're looking at just shy of five miles of uh, roads being redone in the city. Thank you, Steve. Um, that's great. Um, so this, this is another slide that we just like to keep bringing back. It shows how, um, how we finance um, these infrastructure improvements. Um, obviously with state aid, franchise fees, special assessments and municipal contributions. It's kind of the four pillars and those municipal, municipal contributions um, can be um, utility fund revenues, interest revenue, property tax or sales tax revenues. Um, we're not doing that right now. Um, I've kind of looked at it um, kind of on the back end of the 10 year plan, trying to kind of fit that in as our debt continues to get lower, um, trying to kind of fit in a property tax levy. I've, I've you know, been working with various models to see how that will fit in and how it may impact our property taxes to um, actually levy an amount each year. Uh, but another option that the city could consider would be a sales tax revenue um, as opposed to property taxes. But that um, is something that can be talked about in, in future planning sessions. Um, just a real quick discussion on annual debt service. We try to keep it as level as possible. The red line is what the existing debt looks like, and that's if we did not issue any more debt. So obviously with the CIP, about a third of our street projects require debt. And so the blue line is, is what our annual debt service looks like. So as you can see, part of the beauty of the planning ahead um, in, in 2024, you see a little bit of a blip where um, it, it goes up just a little bit. And and we will we will work with that. Um, we will see, you know, what we can do. Um, a lot of times the uh, project amounts change, um, but there is more than likely some uh, placeholder tax increment debt or, or park debt that is also in there. We will, um, you know, we will do everything we can to ensure that we keep the debt service as level as possible so that we don't see a spike in property taxes due to debt payments. And you'll see a, you'll see a low, um, you know, a, a very a gradual trend downward. Um, even with the new debt being issued, we, we will continue to trend downward as, as we are um, lowering out the amount of outstanding debt. So one of our goals has been for a long, long time um, to have standard importers recognize um, our, our debt portfolio as an, a rating of adequate. Right now it's at week. Um, for this particular measure, and that is the projected ratio of governmental funds net direct debt to total revenue. So we, we project what our new CIP debt is based on these projects, and we're able to kind of project what this trend line looks like. Um, so the red line is kind of an estimate of what our total governmental funds revenue looks like, and we just kind of estimate that based on prior years trending. Um, so, the, you know, this very much could change, but at least it gives us an idea. And we've been pretty much right on with this. Um, we initially said that in 2024, we would hit the mark. And then when we built the North Fire Station, we moved it to 2025. Um, but honestly, 2024, that mark of 120% is right on the line there. So we could very well still easily hit this mark in 2024. Um, so we're getting there. We, we, we keep talking about it and we keep, um, we're right in that same kind of range of um, time that we estimated. The other, the other standard and pores rating um, is one that has to do with expenditures and that's the ratio of governmental funds debt service to expenditures. Again, this is a projection. Um, this one is currently at adequate and it will move to strong. Again, I believe the uh, the, the uh, ratio there um, 
where uh, where it moves from adequate to strong would be 15%. So it, again, it is very likely, um, I have projected 14.9% in 2024. So it is, it is very likely that we could meet it in 2024. I'm using 2025 just to be on the safe side, but it is, it is possible. Um, we're estimating expenditures as well as estimating debt service, but we continue to kind of fall within that range. So um, the council's considerations tonight to um, consider whether these outstanding debt goal goals um, fit within um, your idea of, um, of uh, where you want to see the city going with its debt projections. And then the 2022 capital improvement projects, um, whether those um, uh, whether you have any questions about those or any re reprioritations about with those. And um, Mr. Love and I will certainly um, answer any questions that you have right now before I move into a very quick um, demonstration of the online uh, CIP portal. Thank you for that excellent presentation, Ms. Paulseth and Mr. Love. Council members, we are not, obviously we're in a workshop, so we are not taking action tonight. What staff is interested in is a discussion with council members uh, based on our uh, staff report. We should consider how we wish to prioritize planned projects and determine which projects to appropriate for the 2022 budget year. Uh, so with that, let us start with our round robin our last round robin uh, uh, for a workshop uh, uh, because next time we will all be together. But let's start with Council Member Cave. Your thoughts, please, on the CIP proposals. Council Member Cave? Sorry, I'll repeat all that. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I'm sure it was, was very now? good, but we want to hear it. <laughs> it was. Now, you, now, now I forgot it, so it's going to even be longer. Um, thank you. Great presentation. Uh, Mr. Love, I have a, just a question for you with the street projects, and I think it's fantastic how we're going about and we can you know, plan them out, the big projects, five years in advance and not more. Um, my question be the spot paving. Um, do we know how much spot paving we're going to try to do in one year? Or is that kind of like, um, is that up in the air until we, we find stuff to do? I mean, how is that figured out? Mr. Love, uh, do you want to respond to that? Absolutely. Mayor, council. Um, so that, that amount that we have there, that 80,000, we essentially mm -hmm. try to do as much paving as we can with that amount. We know we can't get to everywhere. Um, but you know, it, we try to spread it out throughout the area of the city. So our street superintendent does keep a list of areas where we're get, um, where he is seeing it as well as where we're getting, um, requests for, or work to be done, um, through our asset management program. So it's, it's, um, you know, we're updating that throughout the year, especially if in the springtime, as we come out of the winter and new, new areas. Uh, you know, appear that need uh, more additional help. Yeah, sure. So just just an example about how much does 80,000 really give so the citizens know? I mean, it's not, it, it's a lot of money, but it, how much does, could it really cover? Um, Mayor Council, I, I don't think I have that answer right now. Um, it's something okay. I can provide back later. A lot of it depends on the cost of, of the asphalt. Um, you know, and, and also width of the road, but I, I can I can look into that and see, for example, how how much length we put out uh, last year and send that out in the uh, weekly FYI if you'd like. Okay, sure. I was just wondering, Steve, I mean, I, I get you probably didn't have that. I didn't know if you had just anything off the bat. Um, and what is like asphalt right now? How are we, Is are we in a, a year where it's really expensive? Is it going down in price? What, what's the situation with that? Mayor, Mayor and Council, with uh, the quotes that we've received on, on um, in our in our I'm sorry, not quotes, but our estimates that we've been putting together, uh, mm -hmm. we've seen the, the price be relatively the same as as last year. Uh, we'll certainly be, you know, with the with the projects that we bid out that are being constructed this year, 
we did receive good prices. So that that is still holding uh, fair, fairly close. We've, we're seeing overall projects being um, a little bit higher every year, which is pretty pretty standard, I think, with inflation. Okay, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Juniman. I don't have any specific questions. It was a, a very good presentation and Ellie's been working with us long enough. She knows how she has to water it down so we actually get it. That's sort of entertaining when I say. Um, and I do think that, Steve, it's really been a good thing that we do these, uh, basically these rehab projects like you're talking about. I think it's really cut back on residents' um, disfavor with the with the quality of the roads. And I also believe that you can have been able to uh, re- or send your, your um, staff out to do more, shall we say, important things than that. So I really think that's beginning to be very rewarding. And I, for one, having been here over the long haul, really like how this is looking down the road, um, not only for the debt reduction, but also for how this, we could make the streets projects more pay as you go. I think that's a really good goal. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Juniman. Councilmember Kate, or Knudsen, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I was interested in that uh, one graph where it said adequate and, um, you know, it didn't sound like strong words, but yet on the other hand, I'm thinking of um, financing the uh, fire station. We had such incredible bond ratings. Uh, my sense of it is it's kind of like that 3.9 million set aside, which is really kind of arbitrage, so to speak. It, it's kind of it seems to me that uh, even in spite of the high debt, uh, the raiders are looking at us essentially as how we manage that debt. So when you look at that graph, you know, or the percentage of uh, street improvements paid for by general obligation is way down. Uh, so I, am I reading that right? Um, Mayor Abrams and, yes, Mary Abrams and council, that, that's correct. So you are correct that um, although Standard & Poor's has um, rated our debt portfolio as uh, weak in one area and adequate in another area, it is because of the amount of outstanding debt. And once that uh, reaches those thresholds that we talk about, they will raise that rating. But right now, it's not hurting um, the city's um, very good bond rating of AA+. Um, and the reason for that is there is only one higher notch, and that is a AAA. And sure. there are a number of other things that need to happen in the community um, with regard to the wealth in the community and the tax capacity in the community. Um, mm -hmm. But once the city gets itself to um, an adequate and strong debt rating, um, and there were you know some things that happened with um, the economy in Maplewood, um, it is not at all out of, out of the realm of possibility that Maplewood um, could be a AAA and probably will be someday sure. if it continues to be managed well. Right. So the, and then the more we are good at managing our budget, the better we're going to be. So there's no reason to just go wild or anything like that. So another question I have is, um, what are these funds sources are restricted? Uh, I just thinking of like the park, uh, access fees that we ask developers to pay, are they restricted to the parks? Yes, they are. That's that's correct. Um, there what are other ones. Oh, go ahead. Um, probably, um, well, obviously debt is restricted. Um, you know, debt proceeds is restricted to pay off debt. Um, that is about it as far as um, okay. being restricted in the sense of the accounting term restricted or the debt okay. term. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just a final question. Is um, Mr. Love more expensive than Mr. Nadeau or is there, are they kind of equal? They are a bargain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if anyone wants to be known as a bargain, <laughs> but that was very good. Thanks. Uh, Council member Villa Vicencio. Uh, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the fact that we have this 10-year plan that we can look at. Um, one of my questions is, and it's probably uh, because I'm obviously newer um, to the council, is, um, you know, when I was looking over 
the listing of all the projects, I was wondering if um, uh, one, uh, what the the evaluation is as far as like, you know, when I look at the list, um, it doesn't tell me like um, which ones are at higher priorities than others. And so I was wondering if you could just um, maybe briefly just explain um, how uh, we, you know, take this 10 year plan and then um, make sure that we're doing the most needed things first. And then my other question is, um, about um, uh, with, you know, I see that we have like street improvements and park improvements. And I'm wondering if there is improvements in this plan for um, pathways or sidewalks. Yes, Mr. Mary. Love, I believe that's your, well, Ms. Palsa, do you want to start first with that? It's, it's, sorry, I was gonna answer the first question. Okay, go <laughs> um, ahead. And that was with regard to, um, all right, it just slipped my mind. <laughs> Council Member Villa Vicencio, I was just going to answer it and it slipped my mind. Um, your first question was with regard to... Uh, the evaluation of oh, the uh, each project. Yes, 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 yes priorities. Um, so right now, um, and I will demonstrate that when we look at the online portal, but right now the... Um, the prioritization just really happens kind of with the department heads and the city manager um, on an annual basis. And then when we meet with the council, we look for input there to find out if, you know, the priorities need to be shifted a bit. Um, so we may come up with a with a different um, method for that in the future. I guess it really depends on the input we get from the council. Some cities have a community meeting, um, which, you know, we will be having um, at the planning commission. Um, but really the, the prioritization um, and they're, they're ranked from like one to three each project. Um, that just pretty much happens on a department head and staffing level right now. And so- Ms. Paulson, um, do you want to, uh, maybe you or Mr. Love can talk about our, uh, at least when it comes to equipment our asset management plan and and uh, how that fits into our CIP planning? Certainly, Mr. Love would be glad to do that, I'm sure. Yes, Mr. Love? Uh, Mayor, yes, Mayor and Council. So uh, for many of our physical assets, whether it be buildings, fleet, uh, roads, trails, parks, playgrounds, we have an asset management program uh, that we've been building for a number of years. And many of these assets now are rated uh, for condition, uh, we generally try to, like, for example, the street projects, we rate them once every three years. Uh, we try to get to the worst streets first. So I know that we're doing that with a number of our um, assets now, you know, with, with this rating system. With the building um, asset management plan, that was a plan that was put together a few years ago, and it had the priorities kind of laid out for us. But we do evaluate that in case something is, um, you know, de uh, decreased in in condition quicker than anticipated. Um, I uh, I know that there was another question about sidewalks and trails with our street projects. So with every street project that we do, we uh, on the full reconstruction ones, we look to see if there are uh, ADA improvements that need to be made or new segments uh, installed with that. The the reclaim projects, um, we do not uh, do pedestrian improvements unless it was an ADA improvement because it's really centered on uh, the pavement condition and replacing that. Thank you for those comments. I know that uh, that, that really helps. Since my time on the council, we spent quite a bit of time looking at our assets and making sure that we have a plan to address if we have to replace something, what is the useful life or the expected life of the equipment, uh, the fleet that we have at, sit, at the city uh, so that we can adequately plan for financially paying for those particular items. If it's a, a fire truck or if it's a backhoe or whatever it may be, or if it's something that we need to do with a roof or an HVAC system. We've certainly spent time and we have that available. Uh, if 
Council Member Villa Vicencio, if you'd like to review that, I'm sure Mr. Love can make that available to you. Maybe um, Council Member Cave, as a new council member, you may want to take a look at that as well. I know that uh, uh, we've got a lot of information that goes into helping staff put together the CIP. I noticed tonight that the three road projects that we are that you are proposing we do in 2022 are all evaluated in the low 40s. Uh, you know, it wasn't too long ago that we were working on project on road projects that I remember were down in the 30s, which, you know, certainly um, the lower the number, the worse the road. So that's very helpful information. Uh, so thank you uh, for that presentation. Council Member Villa Vicencio, did you get all of your questions answered? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. And finally, the last thing I'd like to say about this, I want to commend uh, Ms. Paulseth and her staff. Uh, since my time on the council, when I joined and started in 2014, I came onto the council and our debt at that time was $80 million. And so we, the council since then have taken great strides in reducing that debt so that we can actually get into a position of pay as you go, which has been the goal. Uh, and obviously you don't pay repay $80 million in debt overnight, but I think we have uh, the, the pieces in place that will help us get to where we need to go. So thank you very much for pulling this together. Ms. Paulseth, does that give you enough information or would you like anything else from the council? No, no, thank you very much, Mayor Abrams and council. Um, at this time, if there are no other questions, I would just like to very briefly give you a preview about uh, what the CIP um, online portal looks like. Thank you, we'd like to hear it. And Mr. Foltz, could you please verify again? Are you seeing the, uh, are the participants seeing the click off portal right now? We are seeing the PowerPoint presentation still. Okay. I have ended that. How does? Uh, now it looks like you stopped sharing your screen. If you could reshare and then select maybe just the monitor that the CIP. How does that there work? we go. That looks perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I just switch screens there. Um, so what you're seeing here in is um, our new portal. Um, we did have it up and running last year as well, and we did the PDF version side by side um, as we were testing it out. Um, this is not actually the public facing view. As you can see, I'm in editor mode, um, but it'll give you a good idea of uh, what the capabilities are. Um, I will be working with Chad uh, Burgo later this week to figure out how to get it actually up on the website. And um, it, it'll look very similar to this and have similar functionality, but it, it, um, it looks just a little bit more attractive <laughs> when, you, when you're looking at the public facing view, you won't have a lot of this stuff that um, in, in the, on the sidebars and in the background. But um, so what, what you can see here is that in this five year CIP period, um, there's 67 requests and it shows you the amount of money and that's a sim, you know a, the similar amount that we or it's the same amount that we just talked about. Um, you can do a number of different um, things. You can look at um, just one year if you want. Um, I thought I applied that. Okay, I had to take that off. Hmm. Well, I don't know why that's always worked before. But when you see the public facing view, you will be able to, um, you will be able to see that. Um, you can look at, um, it may not have changed this, but what it will do is it will, let me just do this one more time. It will change this down here. Um, so you're just gonna see the dashboard. Um, and at this point, this number is gonna be for the one year and it will show you the capital cost by department. So you can see fire if you hover over it, um, public works, um, and you'll be able to see um, the departments over here. 
Um, and that's just for the one year. So I'm going to go back into multiple years. And you can also screen out by a department. So if you just want to look at fire, you see there are seven for fire and it brings you up the charts for fire and only those projects. So there'll be similar functionality um, in, in, the, uh, in the public facing view. Okay, I'm going to leave that for now. Um, and then the other thing you can look at is um, various different types of requests, but that one isn't really very functional. Um, so again, then I'll just scroll down um, where you can actually drill into all the projects. So you heard Steve talk a little bit earlier about the McMenemy project. So I'll open that one. And again, the um, the public view will look a little bit different, but you'll see a description of the project. You'll see a map of the project. You'll see some uh, some details about the project, um, some charts showing the capital cost. You can drill in and get a breakdown um, of funding sources. You can take a look at that, um, where all the funding is coming from and look at that spreadsheet as well. Um, if you like that view better than the chart view, you can, you can always drill down on either side. Um, and then there's also uh, cost savings. So for every project that we do, we calculate. Some of these numbers are, are, are just ballpark estimates right now, but um, this estimate would tell you that we would expect to save $20,000 a year in maintenance costs on this street. We do have some work to do on that. Um, twenty thousand dollars over the five-year period, so it's it's more than likely more than that. But we're uh, some of these are placeholders for right now, and there's also a map of the the project location. Um, so um, just a very um, quick overview of it. Um, we will have more to show um, later on when you see the public-facing view. Just one more thing when you when you get down to this section. You can look at the, what the capital costs are, but you can also take a look at those operational costs that we talked about. So we add in not only cost savings, but also any additional operational costs um, that we might see. And again, this is for all 67 requests, so we can drill in and get that same information by department or by project. But for the entire CIP, um, the, uh, there's additional costs um, and then you can drill in and, and, and find out what those are. And then these are the cost savings that are calculated for the entire CIP. And then you can also see charts showing the funding sources. Um, I know this is very, very quick. Um, I, I um, just wanted to give you an introduction to it right now. We'll drill into one more. Um, you can see an ambulance project going on here. Um, you find out about um, over the five-year period, we're looking at a couple of ambulances and where they're going to be funded from and what the cost savings is anticipated to be. So um, just a little bit uh, of a preview of, of what this is going to look like. And so it'll be a little bit more interactive for the public to engage with. And that's all I have for tonight. If there are any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, I know that you still have uh, another presentation on your agenda. Yes, we do. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Palseth, just one uh, comment. We'll go through very quickly with the council too, but this looks like a really great resource for our residents to see exactly where we are spending money. Uh, uh, when is this going to be up and running? I, I didn't hear that. Well, it is um, up and running now, and I'll be working with uh, Mr. Burgo, Chad Burgo, our website coordinator this week to try to, um, he knows how to get it um, so that you can click on it on, and uh, and access it from the website. So we'll be up. So our residents will be able to to uh, enter this clear gov on our website. Correct. It'll be right okay. next to our transparency portal that we have right now. And I'll okay. be updating that transparency portal with our new audited 2020 information this week as well. So hopefully um, by the end of this week or the beginning of next week, the transparency portal will be updated with the latest information and the CIP will be available. 
Wonderful, thank you. Let's run through the council members, see if they have any questions for you. Council member Cades. No questions, thank you. Council member Juniman. No, thank you. Council member Knudsen. No questions. And council member Villa Vicencio. Um, I'll just say I really love this idea. I think this is um, going to be a really awesome resource for everybody in Maplewood. Um, I was wondering, it, have you looked or has Chad looked at all um, at the, the mobile version of it? Well, do you know if it'll look work on um, phones? Uh, Council Member Bill Vicencio and Council, uh, not at this time, we don't have a mobile version. Um, I expect that will be happening in the future, but not at this time. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, council members, and thank you, Ms. Paulseth and Mr. Love, for your fine presentation. We are moving on to the Highway 36 Transit Feasibility Study. Uh, Mr. Thompson, you are going to be presenting this tonight. Uh, thank you, Mayor Abrams and council. I'm just going to do a, a brief introduction before I turn it over uh, to um, some staff from uh, Washington County that are with us uh, here today to update the council. Um, over the past year, uh, the city of Maplewood and our staff liaison, who's been uh, Michael Martin in community development, um, have participated in Washington County's uh, leading of a transit, transit feasibility study uh, for the highway, uh, Trunk Highway 36 uh, transit corridor. So along with the cities in the corridor, um, Ramsey County, Hennepin County, MnDOT, and the Met Council, um, we've been uh, participating in this. They're kind of wrapping up this phase uh, or this study. And so we've invited uh, Joe Ayers Johnson and Emily Jorgensen uh, with Washington County to present uh, kind of the, the findings and, and update uh, of the transit study that's been underway. So with that, I believe we have Ms. Jorgensen and Mr. Ayers Johnson here with us this evening. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, I suppose. Uh, Mayor, City Council, Emily Jorgensen. I'm a planner with Washington County uh, and the project manager for the Highway 36 Corridor Transit Feasibility Study. Uh, Jeff did a really good summary. So we were, um, over the past year, we've been working with the, all of our uh, partners in the corridor and looking at transit improvements between Stillwater and Minneapolis along Highway 36. Um, this really has been a baby led by our Commissioner uh, Gary Creasel, who's of District 3 of Washington County, which is kind of the greater Stillwater area. Um, but we've been hard at work and we're excited to show you um, kind of what we've been doing and, and our results and our recommendations. I will put you at ease and say we don't have an immediate ask of you at this point in time, but we wanted to make sure that you're aware of how the study ended up and, and the direction that we are going. Um, and at this point, I'll hand it off to Joy Ayers Johnson, who is the Assistant Project Manager for this project. Yes, thank you, Emily, Mayor, and Council members. Um, we know this will be a lot of new information, so we'll start off with some study background and scope of the study. We will touch on the study goals uh, and give a high-level summary of the public engagement results. Then we'll introduce the transit scenarios that we looked at for consideration, uh, how we evaluated them, and ultimately get into the, the study recommendations and next steps. So some important context for the study uh, is that, you know, our board frequently hear, hears from community members and stakeholders that there's a real need for better transit options in the Highway 36 corridor uh, between Stillwater and Minneapolis and, 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 and around the greater Stillwater area. Uh, and we as staff often hear some, you know, the same thing. So the county board tasked staff with finding out whether it is feasible to bring transit out to the Stillwater area and improve transit options in the Highway 36 corridor. Uh, and if so, what the general look, feel, and cost of that might be. So the purpose of the study is to identify transit needs and recommendations that reflect the corridor needs today and what we anticipate for the future. And as part of this study, uh, we are considering transit and transit facilities that would provide alternative trans, uh, travel options for folks throughout the Highway 36 corridor. Uh, at this point, I think it's important to note that we, we didn't go into this study with any particular transit solution in mind and that this study isn't necessarily determining uh, what is going to happen. It is just looking at what is feasible, uh, which is really the first step towards any transit improvements. 
So the study was led by Emily, myself, and our project consultants in coordination with the project management team, which had members from Washington, Ramsey, and Hennepin counties, as well as MnDOT and the Met Council. The process also featured ongoing coordination with uh, two technical advisory working groups, or TOGs. The city TOG consisted of staff representatives from each city along the, the, the Highway 36 corridor, and the operations TOG had staff representatives from MnDOT, Metro Transit, and Washington County's Community Services. And here I do want to shout out Michael Martin, uh, who was an active participant representing um, Maplewood in meetings and, and helped review the deliverables as they came up, uh, as well as the Maplewood communication staff for helping get the word out about the study. I won't get into all the study goals here in detail, but when we were developing goals, we wanted them to be goals that would uh, address the issues identified during early phases of study. And we know that as we think about the future, uh, we need to be sensitive to the existing context. We recognize that there's a lot of growth planned for the corridor, but that some of the communities prioritize their existing character and do not really anticipate changing much. So we wanted to ensure that that was captured in the goals as well. I'll touch briefly on public engagement here. Um, COVID changed most of our initial engagement plans, but we were able to shift to a lot of online engagement. We conducted virtual focus groups, we hosted and attended uh, virtual meetings, and we created digital content uh, like self-guided presentations and fact sheets that we distributed through our city partners. And one of the key ways that we were able to reach people living, working, or going to school in the Highway 36 corridor uh, was through an online questionnaire, uh, which yielded over 1,200 responses, which at least for us was pretty uh, substantial. Um, we wanted to learn about people's pre-COVID travel and transit habits, what their interest in transit is, and why they may not um, be taking transit today. And we've tried to summarize all of that engagement into the following three bullet points. So it is pretty high level. Uh, the questionnaire revealed that 73% of respondents are interested in taking transit in, the, in this corridor. And you know that wasn't just the once or twice a year to a Twins game, that, that did include people saying that they wanted to take it up to five days a week uh, for things like work or, or recreation or um, shopping. Um, so incorporating that into their lives um, we found out that most of most importance to folks were traffic congestion along Highway 36, improving mobility for people who rely on transit, and improving convenience of traveling without a car in this corridor. And then in, in both focus groups and questionnaires, uh, two needs emerged. And you know, there's that there's that need for east-west travel throughout the Highway 36 corridor and, and connection to the larger transit network. Uh, but there was also a need for travel within that greater Stillwater area. I, we're, we'll transition to some of the transit scenarios here, but before we do, uh, I do want to review the different types of transit service that we looked at during this study. Again, we haven't really locked into any particular type of service yet, but what you see on this slide have all informed uh, what has really become a suite of transit options and the recommendations that have emerged. Uh, so this first uh, mode here, bus rapid transit, it's a high uh, or, or BRT. It's a, it's a higher amenity, higher investment transit option that operates as a sort of hybrid between light rail and your standard bus route. Uh, it either operates in mixed traffic or in its own designated lane. It is typically all day, uh, frequent bi-directional service that has infrequent station locations designed to move lots of people quickly. Uh, you have your express buses. That's your typical park and ride service. They operate primarily during peak morning and afternoon periods, uh, really designed to serve commuters at the start or end of their work shifts. Uh, then you have your local express buses, which are, are more like your regular route bus service, but with more spacing between stops. They have fewer amenities, but are also more flexible in their service timing and stop spacing. And then this last one, uh, on-demand public transit, uh, it, that, that's an emerging service type that's gaining a lot of traction, uh, both like nationally, but also locally. Uh, and it refers to a service that will respond on call and travel anywhere within a, a set geographic region, sometimes even providing uh, door-to-door -door service. 
Uh, and this is something that we'll get into a little bit more in the next slide. So recall that I said that there are those two needs that emerged during this study, both, both in engagement and during preliminary analysis. There's that, that need for east-west travel throughout the Highway 36 corridor, and then there's that need for travel within the greater Stillwater area. Um, On-demand public transit was identified as a potential recommendation to better meet that second need, that, that travel within the greater Stillwater area. And it's not a perfect analogy, uh, but some people think of on-demand public transit as dial-a-ride meets Uber or Lyft. And it's really been carving an, uh, a niche for itself as a transit solution for areas that, that need transit, but where fixed route options have not uh, been successful and are not, not necessarily sustainable long-term. There's no formal route that it circulates. Uh, instead, communities designate a specific service area and users can request a ride via app, website, or phone call. Uh, unlike the Uber or Lyft comparisons, these vehicles are ADA compliant and will sometimes pool riders. They can accommodate bikes or other mobility devices. And there's no price surges, meaning that they're, you know, the fare is reliable. Um, there are also more reliable hours of, of service and more accountability with the drivers. So with the, the stage properly set, I will walk you through the different transit scenarios that we looked at. Uh, there are four transit scenarios, three of which include all the transit types that we just talked about. Uh, bus rapid transit or BRT, that's the, that's the green line uh, on, this, on this slide. Um, commuter express bus is the dotted yellow line. Uh, local express bus is the purple line and on-demand public transit is the blue kidney shape there. And uh, in all four transit scenarios vary primarily by where the eastern terminus of the BRT is located. So for example, uh, here in scenario one, BRT would run from downtown Minneapolis through the University of Minnesota up 280 uh, to 36 and then stop at Rice Street. At Rice Street, there would be a connection to that local express bus service type that would connect all the way out to the Stillwater, Oak Park Heights or Bayport area. Um, and then to address that peak period commuter need, Commuter Express would run from that greater Stillwater area directly to downtown Minneapolis. And then an on-demand public transit service uh, would be established around the greater Stillwater area to serve travel need within that area, and then also to connect folks to the other transit options on the screen. Scenario two is more or less the exact same, except uh, as you'll notice, the eastern terminus of the BRT is moved from Rice Street to Maplewood Mall. Um, this does deviate from 36 a little bit, but it offers a lot of advantages in terms of connections at Maplewood Mall. Uh, there's a lot of different transit service that's, that's uh, run out of there. Transit scenario three, again, that eastern terminus of the BRT is moved a little further east, this time to Hadley Avenue. Uh, the other difference you'll notice is that in this case, the BRT does not run through the University of Minnesota and up 280. In this case, it would just go 36 and then straight down 35W into downtown Minneapolis. That was because the early analysis indicated that the further east you go in the 36 corridor, the less of a connection there was to the University of Minnesota. So we just want to test uh, the two different options to see if there was a if there was much of a difference in terms of ridership. And then this uh, this last scenario differs from the others in that it only includes BRT and on-demand public transit. And this is because in this scenario. Uh, BRT would run all the way out to Stillwater and uh, therefore kind of make the, the express and the local express routes uh, a little redundant and inefficient. Um, so these are the four scenarios we're looking at. And, and again, I just want to be clear that none of these are being advanced as a preferred alternative to move forward to engineering. These scenarios were developed to test for feasibility of transit in the corridor and to be compared against each other as to which ones perform best in terms of ridership and cost. So with that, let's look at some of the primary ways that we do evaluate the scenarios. And, that, and that's through developing and comparing ridership forecasts and operations and maintenance costs and capital costs. And this is where we really put, uh, start to put some numbers to some of these scenarios. And, and what we found out was that all four scenarios are actually very comparable to each other. 
Uh, looking at the chart, you'll see the different scenarios across the top and then the different evaluation measure, uh, measures down the left side of the chart. And in terms of ridership, well, well ridership varied slightly by scenario. Uh, in the transit world, these are all still quite comparable. Uh, and you can see there's a fair amount of overlap in the ridership forecast ranges. And so one of the key takeaways here is that, you know, while scenario two has the highest projected ridership, there's not one scenario that is uh, clearly head and shoulders above the rest. They are, you know, they all feature ridership within a similar margin. And that's really the story across all these metrics. Uh, with regard to operations and maintenance costs, we also see a lot of similarity. Generally, the, the, the further the east the BRT goes, the higher the O&M costs. Um, but again, we see that no scenario is really head and shoulders more expensive than another. Um, when we talk about capital costs, that includes things like uh, right-of-way, buses, stations, and uh, associated infrastructure. And these aren't final costs, but are really estimations used to just get an order of magnitude. You know, what are we looking at here? Um, what, what ballpark? And, and again, it's, it's the same story. All, all four scenarios are, are very comparable to each other. But the heart at the center of our study um, was our transit improvements along Highway 36 between the Stillwater area and downtown Minneapolis feasible. Uh, and the answer is yes. The, the evaluation shows that uh, transit investment in the Highway 36 corridor is feasible. It shows that uh, specifically bus rapid transit or BRT in the Highway 36 corridor is feasible. It shows that transit investment along Highway 36 all the way out to Stillwater is feasible. Um, and so then, you know, it begs the question, which scenario is best? And the answer is we don't know. Um, it wasn't really the goal of the study to identify a scenario to advance. The goal was to determine whether transit in the corridor could, could be feasible um, and get some early evaluation numbers. Identifying the preferred scenario for the corridor would come in future phases and, and it would, it would include many more opportunities for the, for the Highway 36 communities to participate. So with that, I will hand it over to Emily to walk through some of the study recommendations here. Thanks, Joe. Uh, let's move to our next slide. Um, so before I get to our recommendations, we felt given the last you know year, year and a half that all of us have lived through, it was really important for us uh, as we come here today with this big study to make sure that we acknowledge you know the context that we're operating in and the, the challenges that are still ahead of us. Um, so starting with the COVID-19 pandemic across the board, well, and across the world, uh, we still have a lot of financial challenges and constraints. Um, we think about that in terms of municipalities, we think about that in terms of ridership, um, as we think about the transit market, which has not yet bounced back, we're unsure kind of when transit will come back to pre-pandemic levels, what folks' comfort levels are going to be, um, a lot of kind of the commuter market might be forever changed, so we're keeping an eye on that, but we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge it up front. Um, as we move forward, we would want more participation um, from our county and city partners. Uh, Washington County fully funded this uh, study, but we know that our partners at Hennepin and Ramsey have competing transit priorities of other projects um, similar for the city of Maplewood. We know that the city is really involved with the development of, of Gold Line and Rush Line, so you also have competing transit priorities. Uh, so we didn't sense that this was a good time for us to kind of raise this um, as a priority for right now. Um, and similar with the Met Council and Metro Transit, those are stakeholders and project participants that we absolutely need on board um, who are facing their own financial constraints and competing transit priorities, um, which all led us to kind of very thoughtfully kind of lay out what our recommendations and asks will be um, on a chronological timeline just so that we made we made sure we were approaching the right folks at the right time. So let's move to our next slide. So we'll start with our near-term recommendations. Um, this would be that zero to, to you, two year time frame. And really the theme of this time frame is gonna be Washington County focusing on things that Washington County can control. Um, so given the context and challenges of our of our partner agencies, we've uh, the first step for us would be to focus on studying and considering a, a pilot for that on-demand public transit service, that blue kidney shape that you saw on those maps, um, allowing us to kind of identify the best practices and funding options for uh, 
and options for funding sources. Um, and then we also want to continue to prioritize, maintain, and invest in mobility management. Uh, so Washington County has a wonderful woman named Sheila Holbrook White who works in community services, who really is our boots on the ground that um, connects folks who are unable or unwilling to drive with the resources they need, whether that be kind of bus, cab, Uber, volunteer driver, um, to get where they need to go. Um, so continuing to prioritize the work that she does, collecting that data and monitoring those needs. So as transit starts to become um, more developed and more of a possibility out in Washington County, we can make sure that those needs um, will continue to be met. Let's move to our midterm recommendations. So this is three to five years. This is probably about the time in which we'd come back to Maplewood. Um, and really this is centered on a Highway 36 corridor commission. Uh, so some of you may be familiar way back in the day when we had a gateway corridor commission, uh, which is now the gold line um, and similar for rush line as well. But we would um, use the corridor commission really in that same way. We would likely form some sort of joint powers board, but we would use that commission to really kind of bring the planning of the Highway 36 to the next level. So identify funding sources, create a multi-jurisdictional agreement, and really scope out those future studies and projects, whether that's transit service, infrastructure, and really making sure we're including that mobility management piece. And the other recommendation is in regards to Metro Transit in St. Croix County. So on the other side of uh, the St. Croix from Stillwater, we are seeing that um, in St. Croix County, they are moving a lot of dirt all the time. And we know a lot of folks come in from Wisconsin to access jobs throughout the Highway 36 corridor. So as we get away, or hopefully, from the COVID-19 pandemic and, and transit ridership, uh, hopefully increases, you'd want to monitor that need to see if there isn't a need for a commuter express bus that maybe goes across the river and see what that might be like. And let's go to our next slide. Great. So this is our five to eight years out. So these are our longer term um, recommendations. And this focuses on corridor plans and partnerships. So this is where we want to do some more planning for mobility hubs, small area plans with cities, and working with MnDOT to develop uh, transit advantages, which are bus only shoulders. Um, and really kind of starting to actually do more of the actual corridor plans and, and leveraging our, our city partnerships. And let's go to our ongoing recommendations. And then we have recommendations that are ongoing. So this would be a lot of the continuation of the work which we already do, um, which is kind of continue with partnerships. So partnering with cities, partnering with MnDOT, thinking about planning and constructing bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. We know that when things are bike and ped friendly, they're transit friendly, always looking for different funding opportunities to offset local cost shares. Um, and then really continuing engagement efforts throughout uh, future transit projects in the corridor. So as Gold Line and Rush Line comes in, continuing to engage with our uh, corridor stakeholders so that um, as we're thinking about those projects, which are quite far along in development, we can continue to kind of leverage those assets for Highway 36 as well. Go to our last slide. So this was a lot of information and we're where you've got a, an actual meeting in a few minutes here, um, but we would be happy to take any uh, questions that you might have. And we're just particularly interested in your initial reactions to you know, bringing more transit to Maplewood. What does this mean for Highway 36 for you all? And, and how does this align with the transit needs that you hear as a city council? Thank you, Ms. Jorgensen and Mr. Ayers Johnson. Much appreciated. Uh, it uh, certainly transit is a very important issue and will continue to be into the future. I've said very frequently that we just can't build enough roads. We have to look at this from a, through a new lens and have a different perspective on it. I'd like to know, since both of you are transit professionals, what your thoughts are on what we're looking at in terms of ridership changes as a result of the pandemic. What are you hearing? What are you seeing out there? And what are you projecting ahead uh, on how this pandemic will affect ridership on transit? Mayor, City Council, interesting question. Um, it's, it's definitely quite an unknown right now, right? I think, I think one thing we're all comfortable with is that um, making an assumption that that commuter market, that park and ride market likely will not bounce back to pre-pandemic levels in the near term, um, if ever, just given kind of the changes of where folks will be working from in perpetuity. 
um, what was reassuring to us throughout this process as we started to look into ridership and, and project ridership for Highway 36 is um, a lot of the num a lot of the folks that you saw in that projected ridership that Joe went across on that table, those are not people who are park and ride riders. Those are people who um, have transit needs that um, maybe have a, a one car household or a zero car household, but would be taking trips um, within the corridor either for work, but most likely for um, kind of other needs, whether that's medical appointments, um, other types of shopping, if it's if it's childcare related, all those types of things. So we're very encouraged to see that we didn't have a lot of kind of Park and Ride Express folks um, not being well served and not being kind of projected into the future with this. But it is it is quite an unknown. Um, and so I think we'll be we'll be interested to see what happens and um, it kind of really influenced the way that we approached our recommendations, not wanting to um, kind of put the cart in front of the horse here and, and go full bore on, on transit planning. Thank you very much. Let's see if the other council members have any questions. Council member Kate. Yes, um, thank you. To piggyback on the mayors, because I had the same question with that. Um, I would just be willing, or um, I, I, I should say, I'm, I'm interested in seeing a questionnaire that comes out that wasn't pre-COVID. I know this one was pre-COVID, so now I think another round of questionnaires need to come out and see where people are at, and that will be interesting to see. So that was my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Juniman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. This may be too specific, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, uh, on your slides, in uh, the scenarios you said uh, bus rapid transit in the Highway 36 corridor is feasible, um, is that, would it be on the existing roadway or would there be a separate uh, road slash path that would have to be constructed or is that too specific? Uh, Mayor Councilmember Juneman, wonderful question. It's not too specific. Oh, thanks, Joe. He's scooting us to the right page. So we did not assume dedicated guideway. We for this project, we assumed um, what we call highway BRT. So um, it would be, you know, on the th what well, we're assuming it would be on Highway 36 itself. Um, how much of that would be kind of a bus only shoulder versus mixed traffic? Uh, we're not too sure at this point. And um, so that went into all of our assumptions, but again, this is just to kind of get an order of magnitude. We had really thought kind of based on where the BRT ends that we would have scenarios that, that differ quite a bit. And we were a little surprised to see that, that we didn't. <laughs> I am too, actually. And one more question. Um, in your um, conducted surveys and so on and your stakeholders, did you specifically ask questions of seniors, people living in their own homes or people in facilities to know what that, what that role that will play? Yes, we did. Um, wonderful question as well. So we, um, maybe this will be surprising to you all. It was not to us. We did ask some demographic questions for folks, um, you know, who did respond to the survey. And we got quite a few folks who would be in kind of that senior demographic. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that you can imagine it, being out in the Stillwater area. We hear about a lot about people who want to age in place or people who move to a senior facility, have to go up their car, but still want the independence of getting around. Um, yeah. So thinking about kind of around that Maplewood Mall complex, thinking about the ability to connect to Rush Line, um, folks were really, really clear that this is something that they would be interested um, in trying out and something that they would support kind of coming into their neighborhood. Uh, we do know that sometimes seniors are some of the hardest folks to get onto transit, but once they do do it, it's really hard to get them off. Yes, thank you. And I, I do think this would be a, a great way to go with the growing number of seniors and the fact that Metro mobility just isn't going to be able to cut it when there are more people. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Knudsen. Well, I just think um, Highway 36 has been overrun for years. And we got two major problems with that uh, railroad bridge uh, just uh, to the west of um, 35E. That's a constant battle. And you've got uh, a number of entrance lanes that are substandard. So, I mean, something has to be um, helped out. And this looks like a number of great options. And then I think of the Wisconsin folks who didn't say a lot about them, but they really um, need Highway 36 to get uh, to either really, um, either Metro uh, city. So these are great plans. Um, I can't wait. <laughs> Thank you. Councilmember Villa Vicencio. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I agree with uh, Councilmember Knutson. I can't wait either. And I think it's, um, you know, a really good 
um, beginning plan because uh, for one, I am a dependent transit person. And so I look at this as um, a vast number of opportunities or for the potential of which. Um, and, you know, as I was looking over the four scenarios, I mean, um, personally, my opinion is from being a transit advocate and somebody who's taught other people how to ride transit, simplest is always best. And, um, you know, and so, you know, the things that I will be looking for in the future, obviously, is um, safety and, uh, and the pedestrian and bikeway, because if we're talking about folks that are um, transit dependent, um, then obviously they're first pedestrians. And so that's a, a, a huge issue for me and um, the people that I know who ride transit in the Maplewood area. And then the other issue that I really am encouraged about by this project is the fact that the Stillwater area will also bring um, potentially employers to Maplewood. You know, as someone who has, has to hire people on a regular basis, um, there's plenty of times that I would love to hire somebody from um, that pathway. And if there was public transit, then I would be able to hire more people and um, have a much better quality of life for myself and for the people that I am around. So um, I'm excited about this. And I honestly think, you know, just a personal opinion, I believe that the Maplewood Mall scenario and the Stillwater scenario would be the best scenarios. But we'll, we have a lot of work to see forward to obviously make any type of um, decisions. Thank you. Thank you, council members. I don't have any other questions. Thank you uh, for this very good presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be an interesting discussion and I look forward to uh, further talking about this because I agree with council member Knutson, 36 has been overrun for a very long time. <laughs> I know living in Maplewood here, we all use highway 36 quite a bit and we know what the traffic looks like. Uh, so I, I look forward to, uh, to working through this with everyone. So with that, council members, we are done with our agenda. And so therefore, we will adjourn. And I believe we have enough time for Mr. Folds and for staff to get us ready for our 7 o'clock meeting. So with that, we're adjourned at our workshop. And I'll look forward to talking to you in just a few minutes. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor.